you're dismissed if you want to go and uh, be with, uh, with our teens back in the teen room back there. Well, like I, I, I said earlier, um, I had planned to kind of wrap up the, the Lord's Prayer uh, this week, uh, but with the events that, that happened in, in Texas and all of those sorts of things, um, it just seemed like the Holy Spirit was making a move in my life about, about Wednesday, which is like really late. Normally a sermon's wrapped up on Wednesday, so if I have a little panic moving through this sermon, it's just because I'm not as confident as I normally am uh, with them. Um, so I, I thought that really um, what, we, what we need to talk about as a church is dealing with evil, because this week we look evil right in the face. Um, and for me, uh, I'll tell you, it, it's uncomfortable. I, I want to look away. I want to um, look some other direction. It's, it's unimaginable for me to think of 19 children being killed in their, in their classroom. That's just evil. Anyway, whatever you think about mental illness and all of those sorts of things, the reality of that, what happened in that classroom, is evil. Can we all agree on that? That's just, it's just evil. Uh, and, and, and so, um, like many of you, I have been experiencing sadness uh, and grief and anger and outrage and all of them at once and all around uh, through all of those. But, but sadness has been the big one uh, a lot uh, this last week as I've just kind of thought about it and, and prayed about it. And I've talked with some of you and prayed with some of you as you came in to uh, connect with me. And so, um, the, the, here's, here's what I know in, in the midst of all of this. Uh, here's the, the question for us, um, and that is this. What do you do when you are confronted with evil? What, 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 how should we respond? Uh, do we turn away? Do we run away? Um, you know, I, I'm reminded on this Memorial Day, we are honoring people who ran towards evil, ran towards danger, uh, and gave their lives for that. And I am so thankful uh, for them. Uh, but but I, I will tell you, sitting behind a TV watching what was going on, there's nothing I can do but pray, and I've done a lot of that this week, and I, I hope you have been praying uh, for this situation th there as well. And ultimately, though, those kinds of things kind of undermine our sense of security. I know a number of you have talked to me about just not feeling secure and fear for your children going to school. Uh, I, I get that. My son is a school teacher, and and they've processed that as well. And, and even though I know, statistically, it's incredibly unlikely that this would happen in your child's, your child's classroom, right? But in my experience, statistics are not particularly comforting, amen? You know, it's just, it, when it's your kid in their classroom or my son in a classroom, it, it, it's just not. And we just live in an age that seems to have gone crazy, you know, that that, that would happen in classrooms or, or grocery stores or churches, you know? Uh, it's just it's just hard for me to get my my head around, um, and and I'd, I'd I'd like to think that this is an aberrant. It's you know this doesn't happen, but like some of you, I have seen the the meme on Facebook where they list all of the mass shootings in the last 20 years, 25 years, and the list just goes on and on and on and on. It's like I wish I'd never looked at that at that list, and it includes our community, Marysville, as well. And so here's just. The first part of this sermon is going to be hard, and we're going to kind of get a little bit better. But here's, here's just the, the, the truth the, from the Bible. Our world is deeply and profoundly broken. I mean, it just, you can't watch what we've been seeing and not, not get that. And I'll tell you, it's, I think sometimes we don't talk about this quite enough. We tend to like to want to be positive and upbeat. I like a positive and upbeat kind of approach. But, but I'm reminded of the story of Adam and Eve and I don't know where you learned that story, but I learned that story in Sunday school as a little kid. And I remember the, the characters were kind of cartoonish, you know. Uh, Adam and Eve, you know, had, were covered in all the right spots or behind a bush or whatever it was, you know, that piece of it. Uh, and, and, and they were really good looking. I don't know if Adam and Eve were really good looking, but the, in my version of it, they were. And, and even the snake was kind of cute. It wasn't, you know, and generally I don't regard snakes as cute, but, but it was kind of a cartoon version of it. And of course, you know, the, the, the thing that, that she ate and gave to Adam was, was a beautiful red apple. Now that part, I'm pretty sure was wrong, because I live in Washington State, and apples are not evil, okay? It was probably a peach, because those people in Georgia, you know, you know <laughs> sorry. For my friends who live in Georgia, sorry. <laughs> You're throwing me under the bus too today. It's an apple in your world, so... 
And I've read the story and learned the story and they ate the apple and then God came and we live in fallen humanity. But the truth of the matter is we really need to come to the adult version of that, not the child version of that. That story is terrifying because it means that our world is deeply broken and we can't fix it on our own. And honestly, it means we're broken. You know, and, we, and, and evil comes out, out of us. In fact, in philosophy, there's two categories of evil. One is called natural evil. It, it's the things we can't control. It's, it's a hurricane. It, it's an earthquake. It's birth defects. It's cancer and diseases and all those things that we just live in a fallen world, and so bad things happen. But there's this other category of evil called moral evil. And moral evil is when we make a choice that results in evil. Or we withhold, we don't do something. We either do something that is evil or we hold back and something evil happens because of what we did. And when we do that intentionally, it's a moral dilemma for us. And so the horrifying story of Adam and Eve is that we are born with this bent towards evil. But we live in a world filled with evil and pain and, and, and suffering. And it, it, it would be so easy to think, well, you know, it's just a one-time kind of thing. You know, this is, this is the exception to the rule. But it's not. I mean, all I have to do is say to you, Ukraine. And what does that bring up? You know, the images of what's going on on that place. And honestly, there, there are wars going over all over the world, in Africa especially, and, and crazy stuff happening. In fact, we live in a world where children, 12-year-olds, are given guns and sent off to war. That's immoral. That's, that's evil, Amen. It's evil, you know, a world that, that honestly, uh, where old people declare war and young people die. You know, I think there would be a lot less wars if the presidents who declared it had to go sit, at, you know, be on the front lines. I think that'd cut it down quite a bit, you know. It's like, okay, we, we don't want to do this sort of thing. It'd be easy to send someone else off to war. We live in a war, just to expand it, where children go hungry and die of starvation although our world produces more than enough food for everybody to eat. Politics get in the way, and wars, and, and food becomes weaponized to achieve other goals. We live in a world where children die of preventable di diseases. I'm going to say a word that you did not expect to hear from the pulpit this morning. Diarrhea. Do you know that children die of diarrhea in Africa? I mean, to me, that just breaks my heart. I mean, what does it cost for diarrhea medicine at, you know, the pharmacy? Less than 10 bucks, kind of a thing. I mean, for us, we don't even think of it hardly as, as a disease or it's uncomfortable, but I mean, it's... And, and yet we live in a world where that happens because medicine doesn't get where it needs to, to be. We live in a world where even medicine is, is weaponized. We live in a world where children are physically and emotionally and sexually abused in their own homes. One of the most disturbing things for me was speaking with a police officer and how he talked about the vast majority of abuse happens in their home. We live in an evil, fallen kind of world. It just it, it blows my mind away. We, we live in a world where there's still slavery. It's just it's women and children that get drawn into that. In fact, one of the great worries with with the Ukraine situation is that as those women and children were away from their, their husbands and their stable situations, that they were vulnerable to that. It just, I, I just, it's hard for me. It's a great sermon so far. Yay, huh? But, but as I've thought about this, that's the truth. In fact, Jesus knew this. In, in Matthew, he said this. People living in darkness. Matthew 4, 6, Jesus speaking. We live in a world that is filled with darkness. And Jesus was quoting Isaiah, so even way back there they understood that. Adam and Eve is, is the story of the lights going out, flipping the switch, and the world goes to darkness. The pe and, and here's the hard part. People who live in darkness do dark things. They do evil sorts of things. And darkness is a part of the way they, they hide, and they're always surprised when they're caught in the midst of that. And, and I'm going to just... I'm just going to paint the, the picture black this morning for a little bit. It's in the church. I don't know about you, but the story I saw that I found profoundly disturbing because it, it, it impacts my community was the story of the pastor who'd been sexually abusing a 16-year-old girl for years. And he stood up in front of his congregation something like 20 years later 
and confessed and asked for forgiveness and was expecting to go forward. That's evil. Now, fortunately, the girl was there, and she showed up and accused him, and that was the end of it for him. She filled in the rest of the story. But, but it's just a hard thing for us to, to get our heads around in all of that. The real problem here is sin. The bent towards self, the bent towards sinning, the rebellion against what God would have for us. And sin is a cancer to the soul. It destroys us over time, destroys the moral compass. And the longer we live in it and the deeper we darken, dig into it, the worse it becomes. And sin ultimately comes from the heart. So that means only God can take care of that piece of it. Here, here's what Scripture says. Let's look at, um, at 1 John 5, 1-7. through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. This is John speaking of the message from Jesus, okay? God is light. God is light. Okay, good. We're on the same page. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in, dark, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. That's where I say it's in the church. Can I tell you something? Not everybody who goes to church is a follower of Jesus. That's the third one for me we got to get through. There's, those are two different things. Be, being a Christian, going to church, doing all that, that's a religious practice. Ultimately, what changes us is not religious practice, but a changed heart. Amen? Okay? We lie and do not practice, but here's the good part. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and get this, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us. Cleanses, say cleanses. Cleanses us from all sin. That's, that's, that's the hope. I love this is passage. I, one of the things I love about the scripture is it speaks brutally honestly about the world. It speaks brutally honestly about people. I love that it doesn't dress up the disciples. Those guys are the biggest bunch of mess up, off track sort of dudes ever, Amen. I love that Scripture's honest. That makes me believe it, you know? It's like, oh! And it, it speaks honestly about the world. We live in a world filled with darkness. And not only that, there's going to be people that are phonies that are going to say they're living in the light, but they're living in the darkness. Watch out. Be careful. But if we will walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, you know? This, this thing that we do as a church, you know, we're a community church. We, we have connections. We are family. Say, family. For those of you who are new, that's friends who are like family, okay? And sometimes your family is closer to you than your family. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. There's, there's where the hope is in the midst of this. And look at this. John uh, says again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. This isn't any kind of light. This isn't electrical light. Electrical light is good, right? You know, we all like that so we don't stumble. Y'all like light? Or you walk around, you guys got better eyesight than me, you know? I mean, all of you who are raising kids, I know that that is the case for you. Because you've all had the experience of sneaking into your kid's room, because we'll look at them so you can go, oh, aren't they cute? And you step on their Lego and bare feet. The kid's evil. Yeah. The, the, the light. But this is speaking the light of of life, that he has given something in us that, that, that drives out the darkness, that purified us, that there is hope for us, that we can live in a different kind of way. And, and, and so, just to sum those all up, let me say it like this. Your only hope is, our only hope is Jesus, who is the light in the darkness. That is such good news for all of us. No more than, uh, now more than ever, the world needs Jesus' followers to bring the light to the world. Amen? Every time I see these kinds of things, I, I, you know, I know we're not guilty specifically, but there's a part of me that says, we failed. We failed to get the light to that person, to that family, to that, to that community, only if they had seen Jesus, if they had known what it was like to walk in the light. And so let me say, if you are walking in darkness this morning, I challenge you to step into the light. I challenge you and you'll be cleansed from your sins in the past. And, 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 and when I use the word sins here, you know, you've got to be careful because some of you are raised in the church, you know. When I talk about sin, I'm not, not talking about what the preacher said. I'm not talking about what your mama said or your grandma when she set you down with the 100-pound Bible, you know, and kind of thumped on it. Is that the only one that had that experience? Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about that thing that you know in your heart is wrong. 
He says, no, you know, that, that flirtation that's going on, you know that's wrong. The, the, the thing that you're doing at, at work, you, you know, there's there, that, that thing that, that there's a darkness, there's a place, and you know it's destructive, and yet we're attracted to it. That's the nature of sin, is it always looks good. I have a friend who likes to say, and, I, and I, I've just adopted this, sin always costs more than you wanted it to cost and takes you further than you wanted to go. So when I stand up here, I'm not going, you've got to repent because you're not good people, and I am. I'm trying to warn you that there's something dangerous ahead that can derail your life and, and blow things up. And we want to step into the experience. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 7, there's a way that leads to death, and there's a way that leads to life. Choose the life path. If you're on the death path, to this morning is an exit ramp. So you can get off and you can experience the life that Christ has. Choose life. At the end of this, we're going to pray together and, and we're going to sing a song and I'm going to invite you to pray with me and choose life. Take the exit ramp. Experience this kind of light that is in the darkness in the midst of this. And having said that, I want to kind of turn a corner now because that's, that's the cure to what is the darkness. So the question becomes, though, for us who are followers, where is God in all of this? Where is God in, in, in that moment? And, and before we dig, get into this too far, I just need to say this. And I don't think anybody in our church really has this kind of bad theology, but I want to make sure, just, just so you all know, every single one of those children went to heaven. Amen? You understand that? We do not believe that God keeps a child out, out of heaven. They can't sin in the sense of knowingly have a, make a sin because they're, they're too little. They can't, they're not free moral agents, to use big language. And all of that. Every one of them went there. And every one of them was welcomed by Jesus Christ as they came through. And I am here to tell you this morning that they are warm and safe and happy and loved. Okay? And I am really confident, it doesn't say this in Scripture, but I am really confident that heaven has the best playgrounds ever. Okay? I mean, they got slides that are miles long, you know? Uh, some of you are old enough to remember when, when I was growing up, we used to have these there was these really tall slides that were made out of metal and they had a bump in the middle. How many of you remember those kind of slides? Some of them, they were death traps. <laughs> and if you were like me, you know, and remember in summer they were so hot you couldn't go down them, you know? And if some of you were like me, discovered that if you put a little wax paper and wax those babies, you could really go, man. Boom! It's like, again, it's amazing. I grew into adulthood. There's a, there's a guardian angel somewhere when I get to heaven, going to go, well, I want to talk to you, boy. Come here, you know? They have wings that go to the clouds. They live with joy. I, in fact, I, I think at, at the heavenly swimming pool, I think Moses hangs out there and goes, watch this. <laughs> you know? And being a boy, I think King David teaches all the boys how to use a slingshot, and probably some of the girls too, you know? Boom! Maybe Jesus is showing them how to walk on water. I, I, I don't know, but I do want you to know this. Those children are in the presence of God, and it is good. It is good. It's good. Okay, so here's what I want to kind of jump into this with this scripture here. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. In this world, you will have tribulation. I'm, I'm saying this to you so you have peace. Jesus told us right from the beginning, it's going to be bad. There are bad things that are going to happen in the world. And he lived in the first century in, in, in Jerusalem, in, in uh, yeah, where he lived, in Galilee and Jerusalem and all of there. <laughs> you know. And they were occupied by the Roman army. If you know anything about the Roman army in the first century, they were brutal. Was, I mean, there are stories of li literally highways that are lined with crosses where they crucified them. He lived in horrible conditions. And when, so he says tribulation, he's talking about the real deal here. He's talking about horrible, awful things. He told us it was going to be like this. He told us it would be like this. This is one of the great dangers of the prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel is if you, if you love Jesus, he's going to bless you and you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and nothing bad will happen to you. That is a lie. It's just a lie. He said, you in this world, you'll have tribulation. Right there. Okay? So they were wrong. But take courage. 
I have overcome the world. And so here's the problem, here's the solution. The good news is on Easter Sunday morning, Christ rose from the dead and broke the power of sin and death. Okay, that was pretty good, but I mean, we're talking about the single most important truth in the world today, so let's try it again. On Easter Sunday morning, Christ rose from the dead and broke the power of sin and death. Amen. There, thank you, yes. I know you could do, get a little volume there. I've seen some of you watch football games and that kind of thing, so you've got some. So, so the, the good news for us is he has overcome the world. And, and, and the hard part, though, is what do we do in the meantime? We live in a world where it seems like the darkness is winning. Even though we know the darkness can't win, and in the end, God gets the last word, right? One day, we're going to be in heaven. There's going to be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, any of that. And I'm going to spend all of my life, you know, torturing you at your mansions, because mine's going to be close by, you know? We're going to have fun. <laughs> you believe we're going to have fun, right? You know, you may all request a different neighborhood for me, but hey... <laughs> So good news, bad news. Bad news is we will suffer in this world. But here's the good news in the midst of that suffering. God is with you. Turn to the person next to you and say, God is with you. The other way now, God is with you. It's so important that you hear this. Because here's the difference fundamental difference between the prosperity gospel and the gospel of Jesus Christ. The prosperity gospel is you will never have pain if you just believe enough and do what God wants you to do and you will be healthy, wealthy, and wise. But the gospel of Jesus Christ says when you suffer, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You couldn't get away from me if you wanted. We live in a time where it just seems like sometimes we forget this. We get so busy and we're doing and we're disconnected from God until evil breaks in and touches us and then we get serious about God. I mean, I prayed immediately when I saw what was going on. It was like, Lord, help us. It was just kind of an utterance that, that came, came out of that. I, I love the picture that's drawn in Psalms 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, okay, there's the evil, um, I will fear no evil for you are with me and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You are with me. In the Old Testament, all the way through to today, the message has constantly been from Jesus. You are, I am with you, I am with you, I, I am with you. Whatever's going on, God is with you. I, I want you to know that evil grieves the heart of God. Amen? It does. But, but he's with us when we, we come up, up, up against that through our, our lives in the valley of the shadow of death. In the dark place. That's what the valley of the shadow of death was. It was a passage that was dark. It was so dark it was very hard to see in that place, kind of this darkness and light that things going on. And it was very dangerous for the sheep to go, go through that place. And, and they couldn't see the shepherd necessarily. And, and I, I've never done any sheep herding, but they tell me that they're really dumb. You've got to kind of keep them on, on track. And I always wonder about that when he calls us his sheep, you know, and kind of, what are you trying to say, Lord? You know? And he says, I, you are with me. The rod and your staff, they comfort me. And that, that's the power of, of in the dark. The rod, was a, it was like a club. And it had a big thing on the end of it, usually, if they could find one, a big knot on the end of it. And a shepherd would use it to literally, if they could, break the skull of predators, right? They would hit so hard that they would break the skull to protect the sheep. And so it's a reminder that even in the dark, when you cannot see God, even when you can't feel him in the midst of all of that, he is there and he is protecting you. He is watching out for you. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be stunned at how many times the Lord used the rod on our behalf to keep the evil one away from us. Well, he watched out and protected for us. And then the staff, the staff, was you've seen the shepherd's staff, I meant to bring mine, I have one in my office, and it has a hook on it. And it was used by the shepherd to reach out by that particularly dumb sheaf that was about to step off the, cl the cliff, and he'd grab him by the neck and plow him back. I know that's true because the Lord has done that to me several times in my life. Anyone want to say amen, testify right there, you know? It, it, it's just, it, 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 and so this is wonderful. Not only is with you, he's not just observing going, uh, over there, oh, God, man, you went off the side of the cliff. He, he's working on your part, you, and you may, you know, here's a clunk somewhere, or you may get grabbed and someone's to poke the sheep with it. God's poked me several times in my life. <laughs> amen, he's like, oh, I've been there. 
Next week is Pentecost. Um, and we're going to start a whole new sermon series. And we're going to celebrate the coming of the Spirit, God's Spirit. You remember the story in, in Acts 2 where the Spirit was coming? I, I, the problem with the story, some of you guys have been in church a long time, is you know the end of the story, so you don't really kind of get into the story. So like you all know in chapter 1 when Jesus says, I'm going away, you know that the Holy Spirit's coming and this great thing has happened. But understand for the disciples, they had no idea. They didn't know what was coming. They didn't have a guess as to what the Holy Spirit was. The Comforter, I'm going to send you another one to be with you. I just want you to go in Jerusalem and pray. And so they didn't go into that prayer room going, woohoo, we're going to get power, we're going to win people to Jesus, it's going to be great. They went in there going, all is lost. The Savior of the world has returned to the Father and nothing's happened. It's just nothing out there. That's where they went. They went into the dark place. And in the midst of that, again, you know the story, eventually the Holy Spirit comes and falls on all of them and they pour out of there and thousands of people get saved and the kingdom of darkness has to back up because of all the light that's being shined in the midst of the world. There's your preview for, tomorrow, for next Sunday. Be back next Sunday. But here's what I know. Here's, here's, um, this is kind of the, the, the main point in some ways uh, of Pentecost. So this is your preview of, of next Sunday. The very Spirit of God has taken up residence. The very Spirit of the living God has taken, he's taken, he's put down, a, he's laid a foundation for a house, you know, he's put all the plumbing in and all the electrical and put, you know, they, where they do the walls, you can tell I'm really good with construction, right? You know, and, and the house, and the, he, he, he's built a place and he is not moving out. So when I tell you, you couldn't get away from God if you tried, it's because he's in you, you know? He's taken up residence in your life. God is with you through all of this. In fact, this Sunday is Ascension Sunday. We don't talk about that one. But it's the Sunday that Jesus actually went back to heaven. And he went back for the purpose so that he could be freed to come back as the Spirit. Because God is one. Amen? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Think about it too much, you lose your mind. Think about it enough, you lose, don't think about it enough, you lose your soul. God is with you in dark places. He, everywhere you go, you, you just can't get away from him. In fact, I, I, I think, um, I, so my wife was a teacher, right, you know, and my aunt was a teacher, and my son is now a teacher. So I have all these kind of teacherly sort of education words I kind of understand, but I don't really understand. But, but I, I heard about one uh, this, this week. I, I've heard it before, but it, it just really seemed to fit in all of this. It's called object permanence. How many of you know what object permanence is? Yeah. So object permanence is, is a, a part of a child's developmental stage. So, so like when they're little, and the reason we did this because I spent last week with my grandson who was one year old. We went for the birthday party. I didn't know you could get that much cake on your face. But, you know, we went for the birthday party, and, and uh, we were playing peekaboo with him. You ever played peekaboo with a little kid, you know? And they, 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 you'd put it over the thing. We'd put this blanket over him, and he'd rip it off, and we'd go, peekaboo! And he's like, <laughs> he thought that was the funniest thing ever. You know why you guys don't play peekaboo with each other? Other than you'd look silly. It's because you have object permanence. You see, for a child in his stage, when you cover his eyes, he doesn't know you're there anymore. You go away. You don't exist anymore because he can't see you. So when you do this, then, whoo, it's kind of like if somebody kept appearing out of nothing. You'd go, oh, hey, there's somebody there. Oh, they're gone. Oh, hey, there's somebody there. Oh, they're gone. Because they don't have object permanence. But you, you know, if I walk around and go back behind there, none of you are going to think that I just went out of existence, right? You're all going to go, what's he doing back there? <laughs> Sometimes I think as children of God, and maybe as dumb sheep, we struggle with object permanence with God. I can't see him. He must not be here. He's not doing what I think he should be, so he must have abandoned me. Uh, I don't know about God. I haven't heard from him lately. So uh, I want to tell you that God is with you no matter what. You can't get away from him. He's there all the time. In fact, I, I love the Christmas story, Emmanuel, God with us. Say Emmanuel. Now say Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah, the Christmas story that, that Jesus came to rescue it. You and I've had a new insight from that from my kids. I tell you, my children and my grandchildren give me insights into God. We were uh, we were sitting around talking 
uh, one evening and, and Crosby was crawling over things and going everywhere. He's got my ADHD. You can't, he's just going all the time, you know, it's that kind of a thing. And he, he was, I think that's a alert. Um, so, so he was crawling around and, and climbing on me and climbing over other people. And, and my son was sitting kind of a, across the room and he kind of went over this big pile and, and he lost his balance. And instead of crawling down the other side, he fell down the other side. But it wasn't very far. And he smacked his head when he did that. Kind of that kind of thing, you know, when you feel that and all of that. And began to cry immediately. Now, I have watched my son over the years in lots of situations. He's a good athlete. Watched him play soccer. He can move really fast. I have never seen him move so fast in my life as I saw him move that day to get to his son. He was in trouble, and he didn't know how bad it was, and he didn't know that kind of thing. didn't know what was gone, going on in, in his life. And I was reminded in that moment, God runs toward us. God runs toward you. When you're in trouble, when you're struggling with the darkness, when things are going on, when you're confronted with evil, God is moving towards you, not away from you. He's not even standing there going, you know, okay, you know, let's give you some instructions here. He, he's moving towards you just as a parent moves towards their, their child. I love the story of the prodigal son because it's the story of a God who moved towards his son. You remember the story that the, the prodigal son left home, decided he knew better than dad, and he went off on a far country, and he blew all his money and got himself in all kinds of trouble. And at one point, he had at least one brain cell left because he said, you know, I had a better at home. Smart kid. So he goes home. And the story has this interesting part where he's, he's coming towards home, and dad is looking out the window watching for him. And it says that when he saw him, that he ran to hug him. Now you have to understand in their culture, it was undignified for a man to run. And he would literally have to lift his robes up so that he could do that, so his legs were showing, which again, for an older man, was, was inappropriate. It's kind of like if one of you were running around in your underwear. So, no illustrations today about this. He pulls it up, and he runs for his son. His son who had embarrassed him publicly. It was a shame to have a child do that. His son who had weakened the family financially because of the, the money he had taken out of probably a third of the entire family wealth. His son who had rejected him and probably said all kinds of words in those moments that, you know what kind of words I'm talking about. That, that are, I'm not talking about cuss words. I'm talking about words that cut into a life. And he loved his son so much. When he saw the opportunity, he said, I don't care what people think. And up come the robes, and there he goes. And I am here to tell you, that story is about how God moves towards you and towards me in these times. Hebrews 6 says something that I, 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 I love. Well, let's, let me get the next one. Jesus is the hope of the world. That's what that story is about. Jesus is the hope of the world. We are, we are touched by evil. God moves in in the midst of it. He's the only one that can change it. And the good news is, he isn't just going to set up some sort of thing to contain it. He wants to annihilate it. He wants to cremate it. He wants to, he wants to conquer it. That's what the resurrection is. God is with us, and, and it's been conquered. Hebrews 6, it talks about Jesus as our anchor. I like that anchor illustration. You all go out here understand anchors, right? When I pastored in Kansas City, they did not understand anchors, you know. When I was growing up, we, we would fish on the Chehalis River, which is, is close to the ocean. And so when, when the ocean, the, the river's going out and the tide is going out, there's very little resistance against that. And so the, the, the river runs really, really hard. We weren't very close. We were very close to the ocean right there at the base of Graves Harbor. And so when we would go fishing, we would have to put an anchor out. And it would pull so hard on the boat that, that sometimes even the anchor would, would come loose and all of that. And then you kind of get, you have to go back up and, and that whole process. But for any of you who've been in that situation, you know that an anchor that is set right, there's just almost nothing that can move you, man. I remember the water rushing by and all of that. And we're just sitting in the boat having a good time in the same place. There was nothing the, the river could do to us. So it is with Christ. If you are anchored in him, it doesn't matter that the evil blows around you. It can't, it can't harm you. He is your anchor. Put your anchor in him. Because you can put your anchor in all kinds of other things that aren't going to help. Can I just be frank again? Politicians will never make the right laws or implement the right programs to overcome evil. 
Amen? And I don't care which party you're in. Pick it. It's the same thing with either party. Humanity has been trying to do that for thousands of years, and we can't get it right. We still have evil in the world. In fact, the Old Testament is kind of the story of God giving us the law. He starts with Ten Commandments. By the end, there's hundreds of commandments, and it's still not working, right? So even God's going, I tried that plan. It doesn't work. Because what they need is not something from the outside to pressure them to do the right thing. What we all need is something from the inside that makes us want to do the right thing. To change us into the image of Christ in the midst of it. There's another thing about the Holy Spirit and God in here that I love. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. Say comforter. How many of you have comforters on your bed? You know, one point, yeah, winter, the comforter is so great. I just love it. Okay, I'm going to give too much information about me. But I like to open the window in the winter, right? And just like really, really cold. You pull the comforter up. I mean, that's like, that's living. My wife doesn't think so. But, but that, that's, that, that just is, that's what, and, and the, the word comforter carries that idea that there is something about what Christ does in our life that can bring comfort to us. God makes available to us supernatural comfort from God. And I've seen this happen. I saw this happen this week with some people that came in to talk with me and wanted me to pray with them. And so I talked with them about what had happened, and we kind of prayed together. And I, I literally see the countenance of their face change. When I get to the end, and I'm crying, and they're crying, and I say, amen. We open up, and we look, and I can just see the countenance. And then they'll say a day or so later, Pastor, I don't know, but it was just something happened in that moment. Yeah, God happened in that moment. Hello? You know? That he moves in with that peace that is, that is supernatural in, in, in the midst of all of that. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. Say the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And I want to encourage you in these days to look to him in all of that. And then, sideways grace is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. We haven't talked about sideways grace. I used to talk about it a lot and kind of other things have come along. It's the, the idea of the grace that goes this way. The Holy Spirit is our comforter is the grace that comes this way. When the, when the Holy Spirit comes down and blesses us and puts peace in our heart and comfort, it doesn't make the evil go away, but, but it, there's something in us. Sideways grace is when we turn that and we begin to share it with the people around us. We begin to bring grace to, to them. Romans 12 says, weep with those who weep. Sideways grace is what we do when we pray for one another. When, when you hug each other and cry together. When, when you sit with each other and just, just listen. You know, one of the things that was really hard for me, I know this is a surprise, but hard for me to learn was to just sit and listen without talking. That is a major challenge in my life because I kind of like to talk, you know. Man, there are times when you just sit and just listen to, to what they have to say, that we can comfort each other through all of that. And, and be Jesus. Allow the Spirit to, to use you for His work. Pray for one another. All of those sorts of things we do through sight. Say sideways grace. So I, I just want to encourage you. Seek the Holy Spirit for comfort in these times, but also give sideways grace to one another. And when someone brings you sideways grace, would you accept it? Would you just, I mean, this is an important sort of thing. Some of you know I'm not a big hugger. And several of you set out as your goal in life to make me a hugger. I don't know. And, uh, you know what I learned? I, I still don't initiate hugs typically, but, you know, sometimes a hug is a good thing. Turns out there's something comforting in, 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 in that moment with all of that. So it is important that we, we grieve the, the evil. Jesus grieved the evil. Uh, Jesus grieved in life for things. And in fact, there's a whole book in, in, in the Bible called Lamentations. You know what Lamentations is about? Lament, grieve in, in, in all of that. Again, another problem with the, the prosperity gospel is this idea that if everything is going well in your life, then you have nothing to grieve about. So if you grieve, there must be something wrong with you spiritually. Boy, is that sick. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches there are going to be times when we need to grieve, we need to turn to Christ, we need to turn to one another. In fact, the Jews were really good at this. They would do sackcloth and ashes, you know, dress up in a, like a gunny bag, kind of gunny sack kind of thing, which, ooh, would that be itchy? And then pour ashes on your head and pour it all over. You know, I should have just had ashes for you. So you could all put ashes on your head this week. Wouldn't that be a good little... No, okay, we don't want to do that. Jesus grieved. We should, we should grieve. And then Jesus is the hope of the world, and we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are to be there to, to reach out and, and connect with others, to bring hope to to bring light. In fact, in Matthew 5, Jesus said, you, Jesus speaking to his followers, are the light of the world. 
We love to say Jesus is the light of the world. Say Jesus is the light of the world. And he is. But he said, we are the light of the world. Now see, I think it's the flame that is the light. I think that's the Jesus in the thing. But if this room were pitch black, I could walk around and bring light to all of you. And you remember our Christmas Eve service when we go down to just the Christ candle and it's pitch dark in here. And I take a little piece off of it and my little light, and then there's two lights. It's still very dark. And I turn to the person next to me and I say, Jesus is the light of the world. I go to the other person and I say, Jesus is the light of the world. And we light their candles. We're up to four candles. woo And they give it to the next person and the next person, and we're usually packed, so we send missionaries to the dark parts of our church, the corners, and they begin to light, and you hear the voices. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus. And by the end, you can take a picture in here because there's so much light. And that's what that's what's saying. Not, not only has the light come to you, that God has done something to you, but that he calls you to, to go to others to bring the light to a dark world. You are called to bring the light to a dark world. Amen? All right. And just, I'm going too long, but wrapping up here. Jesus gets the final word, and his word is life. Amen? We are resurrection people. One day, he's going to wipe every tear from our eye and, and, and take away all the pain and all the sorrow. And musicians, would you come? Uh, because I'm not, and that's not connected to pain and sorrow of the film, but, but uh, bring them in if you come out. I, I want you to know that this world is temporary, and, I, and we're a church that's deeply engaged in making a difference in our community. That is so important. That is a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we can get so that we, so that we kind of forget the heaven part. And you can go both ways on this. My dad used to say some people were so, so heavenly-minded there were no earthly good. He was right about them. But we don't want to be so earthly good that we forget that one day, one day, Jesus is going to split the eastern skies and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we will be together for eternity. And there will be no shooting. No need for cops, no need for military, no need for all of that. And all God's people said, Amen. I want to pray for you really quickly. I know my time is gone. If you're living in the darkness, would you ask Christ to come in and change your thing? Father God, I pray right now especially for that one that maybe knows they're living in darkness. There's something in their life that they know is wrong, and it's consuming them and it's destroying them, Father. Would you help them in this moment? Just ask, Jesus, come into my heart. And say, cleanse my heart. I will follow you. And then tell someone, Father, I pray that you would do that and that they would be birthed into new life right now. I pray for all of us, Father, that you would be the comforter, that we would look to you and that you would give us your peace, Father, and that we would extend it to the world around us. Maybe, just maybe, that as we bring the light to others, Father, that they too might come to know you. The light might shine in our world because we believe Jesus is the only hope.